Today we have a short time for sermon. And as uh, <coughs> Murphy's Law would have it, I have three sermons to preach today. So short time plus three sermons, so they have to be long. I mean short, sorry. Today is the eve of the second Sunday of May, which is the Mother's Day. And today we have, uh, from the beginning of the Sabbath school, we have uh, been exposed to all the themes, all the activities with the theme of Mother's Day, right? And if you look at the, um, the slide, Happy Mother's Day, and it was a drawing of a, perhaps a child for the mother. And what do you see? You see the word mommy? You see what? What else do you see? Hearts eh, representing love. Okay? Now, Happy Mother's Day to all mothers in our midst. Uh, I just want to let those of you who have not been reading on Google, the Mother's Day was actually an American holiday. It was uh, inaugurated by President Woodrow Wilson. And it was championed by an American lady by the name of Anna Mary Javis. <laughs> now, we all know that Mother's Day is about mother, appreciating mother, it's about love, right? It's about the heart. The Bible text we read, My son, give me thy heart, and let thy eyes observe my ways. Now you notice here, again, it has to do with Mother's Day, right? And what is the mother's wish? Rolls Royce, big condos, lots of gifts, a lot of money. Is that what mothers want from children? What is a mother's wish? You know, sometimes we look at the people in the West <coughs> as very, maybe, uh, shallow. Sorry to say that, some of us are from the West or educated in the West. But not true. Anna Marie Javis, in her promotion of Mother's Day, promoted that Mother's Day should be a day that we dedicate to express our love for our mother the whole year round. It's not a day only in the year that you thank your mother. No. It has to be your appreciation that you well up in you that you express on that particular day that everybody celebrates together. Now, isn't that something? <laughs> in fact, she said that on Mother's Day, and in fact throughout the year, our appreciation for the mother is nothing to do with material things. And she said, no poor mother, no mothers from poor family should be deprived of the same appreciation from their children. Why? Because it has nothing to do with materialism. In fact, towards the end of her life, Anna Mary Javis fought to abolish Mother's Day <coughs> because when she went to the mall, she noticed that people are buying cards and a lot of things are materialistic. And she felt that then poor family will feel that they are not loving their mother, which is not true. <coughs> Many thousand years ago, <coughs> the Chinese has this proverb for those of you who know Chinese. Wan san xiao wei shou, wen xin bu wen si, wen si jia ping wu xiao zi. <coughs> Actually, it's a poem, huh? It's a poem. It says, it means that of all the virtues in the world, Loving your mother and father is the highest virtue. Okay? There's one son, Xiao Wei So. Wen Xing Pu Wen Si means you ask your heart how much you appreciate them, not how much material things you can give them. You ask yourself how much heart you have for them. Because it says, Wen Si Jia Ping Wu Xiao Zi, meaning if you are saying that. Love must be expressed by giving material things. Then there is no filial sons and daughters in a poor family. So this is basically the first sermon. That mothers wish for the children 
is their heart. Not how many condos you can buy for them. Not how many nice clothings on the day of Mother's Day you can give to them. But what is in your heart? And that's why the Bible says here, My son, give me thy heart and let thy eyes observe my ways. <laughs> the problem with the world today is a problem of heart. We have a divided heart that leads to God's broken heart. And that leads to a mother's broken heart because we, our hearts are divided. Dia Moody said, the problem with us is our divided heart because God cannot accept a divided heart. He must be the absolute monarch. There is no room in your heart for two thrones. You cannot mix the worship of the true God with the worship of any other God more than you can mix oil and water. It cannot be done. There is no room for any other throne in the heart. If Christ is there, if worldliness should come in, godliness will go out. <laughs> and this is precisely what breaks our heart or what divides us. When God is not having the whole heart, when we are divided in our heart, then God will have a broken heart. And when our love for our mother, our heart for our mother, is divided by so many other things, then we give our mother a broken heart. So, the connection between the first sermon and the second sermon is actually the heart. The mother, every mother in the world, wants the heart of their children. That they have a place in the children's heart. And when our heart is so divided by so many things, you know, social media, work, our strive for achievement, our love for other things, sometimes we find no place in our heart for our mothers. And that is what breaks their heart. Same thing with God. God wants our whole heart because it's a matter of heart that we are talking about. Now we go to the second sermon and it says that the story of the prodigal son, right? Now the story of the prodigal son is a very simple story. It has only a few parts. Okay? And if you look at it, it's simply something to do with home. It talks about the prodigal son hated home. Right? Those of you who do not know the story, go home and read it. So then, first thing, he hated home. So what he did? He left home. Then after that, what happened to him? He forgot his home. He lived his life, forgetting all the values of his home. And then, he came to a point, he remembered home. And then, he missed home. And then, he came home. That is the story. Now, in this whole story, what is the connecting point? It's really the heart. Or maybe in other words we use is the awareness. <laughs> if you look at the prodigal son story, basically it was his heart. First, his heart hated home. Right? And that's why then he had some action. He left home. And then his heart forgot home. Right? And then his heart remembered home through a lot of things that's happening outside, which I encourage you to go and read if you don't know. And then his heart missed home. And finally, action, he came home. So it's the heart that led to action. So the second point I want to bring to you in the second sermon that linked to the first is that heart, although it's a prime important, it also leads to action. And so like this chart shows, basically if you look at it, there is the awareness thing and then a decision thing and then the action thing. Why do I share with you? Although all of you are experts in all this, why do I share with you this? Because it is starting with the heart. Whether it's to love to our mother or love towards God or love towards our home, it all starts with the heart. But the heart must lead to some decision and the decision will lead to action. Today, I want to share with you that my third sermon is basically 
the prodigal Laodicean. We know that we live in the last days and we live in the age of Laodicea. We are the church of the Laodicean. We are the Laodiceans. It's you and we actually are prodigal. We are prodigal sons and daughters of God. And that's why these three sermons are linked together with the same thing that is our heart. Now today I want to share with you that the prodigal son's problem is really a heart problem. Why do I call it a heart problem? Because the Bible says that we are neither cold nor hot. Okay? Now, first of all, let's establish some <coughs> main points here. You see, God, in His infinite wisdom, has died for the world in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus was resurrected and He went back to heaven, leaving behind the church to finish the work on earth. So the church of God is appointed it's God's appointed agency for the salvation of man. And that's why, my brothers and sisters, in the Bible, there is very straight, straight and very strict ammunition against people who fight against God's church. The church is God's apple of God's eyes. And if anyone touches your apple of your eye, your hand will automatically come and hit it, whatever comes along. And God is like that with the church. God protects His church like the apple of His eyes. And also because the church is the only instrument that God has chosen to finish His work on earth. Okay? Even though the church is not perfect, we are the only hope of God. And the Satan knows that. And that's why in the Bible it says that you are in great danger. The prodigal Laodicean. And when I say the prodigal Laodicean, I'm talking about each of every one of you, excluding, of course, those who are not Christians, who are just learning about Christ. You're still not part of it yet. But the rest of you who are Christian, I want to tell you, you are in grave danger. Because the Bible says that the dragon has, was enraged at the woman, and the woman represented the church, and went off to fight the war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold the testimony of Jesus. That's you and I. And therefore, the prodigal Laodicean, that's you and me, must guard our heart. The Bible in 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a rolling lion looking for someone he might devour. And we went through this one in the Sabbath school, if you attended the Sabbath school today. The Satan is out to get us. And there are many ways he's going to get us. But in the age of Laodicea, as prodigal Laodicean, we know Satan's greatest trick is to attack our heart. Because this morning in the Sabbath school, if you go to Friday's lesson or Thursday's lesson, it talks about this text but it talks about suffering. But let me ask you, how many of you are suffering from persecutions? How many? How many of you are suffering because you have lack of money? How many are suffering because people are not allowing you to pray? How many of you are suffering because you are not allowed to read your Bible? How many of you are suffering because you cannot share Jesus Christ with your family? I think very few, okay? Because we live in the world that is very nicely staged for us. Satan knows. Okay, he has two strategies. One is to use the tough method. If you cannot win, then you try to win the heart. And I think the prodigal relation, each of every one of us today here, we have to ask the question, have we guarded our heart? Yes, Satan has his own style and strategies to attack the church, persecution, and worldly attraction. Satan doesn't care whether you give up your faith because you're persecuted or you give up your heart because the world is more attractive to you. Internal conflict. The Bible says that because of the 
abundance of iniquities, our love has grown cold. And that is one way Satan will take away our heart from God. False beliefs. We have to guard our hearts against many false beliefs, my friends. Some false beliefs are very close to the truth. Especially in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have a false belief that at the end, you still have to do something to be saved. That even though Jesus is all, you still have to do something. Oh, don't tell me it's not there. You will hear many preachers stand up here and bring up lift Jesus and say he is salvation. But at the end, he will say, but you know you must do something. Recognize that as part of the error that has come into the church. That salvation in truth is only in Christ Jesus. Whatever we do is because we love Jesus, because of our heart. Slow and unnoticed erosion of love is happening to every one of us. Without knowing it, without being aware, we have left God and left home. And Satan has another strategy to mix tares with wheat. Those who are real Christians and those who are just a mixed multitude. Uh, Dr. Poon is in the midst, in our midst. Remember, he taught me Hebrew, you know, Amhares, right? The, 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 the mixed multitude, the Amhares. And we get discouraged. We say, oh, wow, you know, the church is not perfect. And slowly our heart is drawn away. So God also tells us there is spiritual pride among us. You know what is pride or not? Many of us talk about it but don't really know what pride is, especially spiritual pride. Do you have spiritual pride? Huh. <clears throat> According to uh, ancient history, there was a general who was promoted to be the top general in his country, China. He went to see a monk and he asked the monk, tell me, teach me what is pride. Teach me what is pride. And the monk looked at him he said, what kind of stupid question you're asking? What kind of stupid fellow will ask this kind of question? And the general was so angry, he started to boil with anger. And he told the monk, how dare you talk to me like that? And the monk said, oh, I'm sorry. I was it's describing pride to you. What you have just displayed is pride. That you think you're better. You think you should not be Question, you think I should not call you stupid? That is pride. Do we have spiritual pride? O oh, prodigal religion. And I'm talking to each of you sitting in the seats who are Christian. Do you have self-deceit? <clears throat> to the angel of the church in the Odisha write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the true ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth, and you say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. <clears throat> the connection I think we have, I have today, from the second to the third sermon, the prodigal son and the prodigal Laodicean, is the situation that we are in. We are at the stage of the prodigal son when he was feeding the pigs. We are naked, we are dirty, we are poor, we don't know it. I would say we are at the stage between the what? The forgot, forgot home and remember home. And it's all a matter of our heart. Have we forgotten our home, my brothers and sisters? Has the world has so blinded our eyes that we sit here and we call ourselves the church of God, that we call ourselves children of God, but actually our heart is far away from God? That we are actually naked. 
that we are actually blind and that we think we are rich and we think we are close to God. That is the linkage of these three sermons. The heart, the stage, and where we are. And so, let's come back and use the model. Are we aware? It is found that many Christians are so used to talking about the Laodicean church that they stop doing something about it. They have been educated beyond obedience. Meaning you know so much, you say, ah, yeah, 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 I know. But no action. No awareness, no decision, no action. And this will be the downfall if we do not wake up. And so the Bible tells us, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich, white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. For those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. In this text, God is saying something. God is saying it's a matter of heart. And I'm telling you out of my heart because God said those whom I love. Again, it comes back to our heart. God loves us and that's why he's telling us all this. So what must we do? First, we must become aware of what we are in or where we are, what situation we are in. And then the Bible says, you must turn back to God. How? You must build up your faith. Buy purified gold every morning, every evening, every day. Do you fight the fight of faith? Do you fight for the time to read your Bible, to pray to God? That is the fight you should fight for, not to fight against sins or against other people. Do you buy white robes, Christ's righteousness? Do you take upon Christ's righteousness upon yourself and stop trying to do something good in order to be safe? I know it's a very tricky thing to say and to do, but all the good things we do must not have any tinge of being part of working for salvation and buy eye ointment, spiritual insights. We need spiritual insights. We must pray for spiritual insights. <clears throat> Obedience to God. Regain zeal for God and repent. Mrs. White mentioned in her writings that every day we must repent. Not once in the lifetime, you know. Every day we must repent. Now, repentance, many of us do not understand. And again, I go back to my professor, right? <clears throat> Metanoia, repentance. It means after thinking, change your direction. After thinking, change, it has nothing to do with crying. You know, something we think repentance means I have to sit down and cry and be... No, that comes with it. Lah. Can, no problem. But the more important thing is really to know what is good and change. So every day we repent. If you drive to the wrong place, repent and go to the right place. Right? Sometimes when we drive, we turn the wrong corner. Immediately, I tell myself, repent now, turn back. Okay? We must repent every day because we are not perfect. God says to the prodigal Laodicean, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and he with me. Again, it has to, it's a matter of the heart. So how do we respond? We accept Jesus into our heart again. We open the door when we hear the knocking. Paul's example of single-hearted single -hearted devotion. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Only Christ and Him crucified. As Christians of many years, I can tell you this is harder said than done. Okay? Only Christ and Him crucified. Secondly, single-heartedly move forward. Move forward, but towards home. A final reward that is given to the prodigal pro Laodicean is the same reward that awaited the prodigal son. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
My dear brothers and sisters, today we started with the Mother's Day message and we ended with the prodigal Laodicean message. They are all connected. There are two parties, mothers, God. The other party, us, the Laodicean, the prodigal. And things that connect these all three is actually our heart. Things that we need to do is to become aware of what, where we are and then make a decision and then go home. That's all. It's simple. May the Lord bless each and every one of us.